today the bit that was just read from Matthew chapter 16. It could quite easily be broken into two different sections and uh, be the substance of two different sermons. In the first section, Jesus reveals the true nature of his mission in the world. Up to this point in time, Jesus was pretty popular with the crowds. He was healing the sick, restoring sight to the blind, performing miracles, wonders. And he was saying wise things. People were drawn to him in um, great numbers. But then today, in this bit of Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says that he has to go to Jerusalem to suffer and to die and then to rise again. And it doesn't just say that he's going to go to Jerusalem and he is going to be killed. He says that he must go and die. In the second section, Jesus calls on his disciples and by extension all of us to follow Him. And sometimes following Him means suffering, means death, but it means resurrection. Jesus was expert at asking challenging questions. He knew just exactly what to say to the right person to get them to think, get underneath their skin, maybe. And he asks this question in a couple of different ways. He says, what does it profit a man or a woman? What would it profit anyone to gain the whole world and then lose your life? This is kind of a, a you know, a couple weeks ago he was talking about, Jesus was talking about, well, a man, you know, he likes to use stories and parables. And so he talked about a man who discovered a pearl of great price. And, and Jesus is trying to appeal to the common sense realities of the people he's speaking to. And sometimes, because he's talking to uh, fishermen or builders or laborers, he uses their terminologies and their sort of speak. Well, today I think he's using the language of commerce, which many of us, or many in this room, I don't say us, because that would not include me uh, for certain, but many folks are familiar with what it means to balance profits and loss. And that you would ideally like to have more on one side than the other. And Jesus says, what would it profit someone if they became the richest human being in the world and they owned kingdoms and banks and professional basketball teams? But yet their hearts were distant from the God who had created them. And by that distance, they would ultimately die and all of that money, all of that fame, all of that wealth would be passed on to someone else. Questions today? Closed by Jesus. It's not a simple question. It actually forces us to think about things that we might not otherwise want to think. It forces us to consider matters of eternity, eternal life, of death, of what happens when you die, what happens to our belongings, of, of the brevity of our lives on this planet Earth. Or it causes us to question, what am I doing with my existence or whether I am actually wasting my life? Whether my life is oriented exactly toward my own selfishness, my own selfish preoccupations, whether my life is in fact oriented in a different way altogether. All of that, all of those sorts of things are wrapped up in this one question that Jesus asks. What would it profit someone to gain all the world and yet lose their soul? It's very, very 
universal question. It never goes out of style. It applies in every culture. It applies to every human being, no matter what their ethnic group is or their social standing. Now, there are some here today that are um, kind of have a scientific background or engineering background. I know that some of you do, or mathematics. And that's not really the realm that, that my mind works in mostly, kind of in uh, other, other stuff, but you are aware that we live in a world where science and the modern wonders of invention are treated like a religion, right? You're aware of that. But there are some who would take Let's say the writings of uh, Stephen Hawking. Even if you don't know a lot about science, you may know that name. He's kind of famous. He's the man who, um, I think he teaches at Oxford or Cambridge, and he is, um, but he's one of the most brilliant minds alive on the planet Earth right now. The theoretical physicist, Stephen Hawking. And a few years ago, he wrote a book that became kind of a bestseller called The Brief History of Time. And I, I read it, and I, you know, there's a lot in there I don't, that's beyond my non-scientific mind ability to grasp. But, but through this book, what he's doing is he's trying to develop a, an outlook on everything without any God. How can we make the universe and everything in it, including ourselves, make sense mathematically by the laws of nature without any divine intervention or any hand of a benevolent being that is more powerful than we ourselves? And this book, A Brief History of Time, may be a brilliant piece of scientific writing, but it is also a bold affirmation of atheism, an outlook of life that is without God. But I think it's interesting that even he, even Stephen Hawking, is prepared to acknowledge that when he's done his best, to create, as it were, a mathematical model to explain the universe and to explain our existence within the universe, that he then writes, a mathematical model cannot answer the question of why there should be a universe for the model to describe. Then he explains, why does the universe go to all the bother of existing. I think that's, that frankness is quite refreshing. He doesn't believe in God, but when you take God out of the question, ultimately, the question of why are we here cannot really be answered. It's just an accident. And I am here standing before you, and you are seated where you are next to your loved ones. The arrogant critics of religion are speechless when it comes to those questions of why do we exist? Why are we on this planet? What is life for? Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? Forfeits soul for his life. Jesus goes on to answer this question and says, Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it or will save it. Now I'm not sure that I understood this passage before this week, if indeed I understand it now. <laughs> I think I do. Up until this week, though, I often thought of this. This verse. And I thought that what Jesus was saying was that the selfish person, 
person that lives ultimately to please and gratify themselves above all else will be punished by having their life taken from them. In other words, that there is a threat in this. That Jesus was issuing this statement as a form of a threat. If you're selfish, you know what's going to happen to you. You know, like a mother speaking to her children. Johnny, you don't share with your sister. You're not going to get any cookies later. But actually, when I read this again and study it, I realize that I don't think this is a threat. It's just an observation. Jesus is not here necessarily speaking about a punishment factor. Rather, he is pointing out what happens when a person lives their lives according to their own way, apart from them. We can illustrate this lots of places in the Bible. One of the wisest men that ever lived was uh, King Solomon. If you would like to read a book of the Bible for a little homework, then you could read the book of Ecclesiastes by Solomon. It is essentially the journey of one man trying to solve the riddle of life without really considering eternity. And he goes down a whole series of dead-end streets. And I'm sure that, that we are quite familiar with some of those dead-end streets. First he says, I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. In other words, I walked the pathway of intellectualism. I thought that perhaps by making sure that I was as clever as I could be and as credential as anyone, I would be able then to solve the riddle of the meaning of life. But then, he says, what is twisted cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. He said that ultimately I'm still left with more questions than I have answers. Kind of like Stephen Hawking. And so Solomon says, next I tried to go down the pleasure street. But I also found that seeking for pleasure was like drinking salt water. The more you drink, the more you had to have, and the more you had, the more thirsty you became. And so I went another way, and he says, then I just decided to amass stuff, possessions. I denied myself nothing that I could see. I refused my heart. No acquisition that I desired. I engaged in acquiring everything that was around me. And then I realized that when I put everything together and sat and looked at it, it didn't satisfy either. Solomon is just one example. Listen to Jesus' question again. What advantage is there to one who gains the world loses his own soul. My friends, we are called on to be followers of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Disciples. And a disciple is a student, but it's more than just, well, we go to, uh, like you go to school, you know, and you sit there passively, take notes, daydream, go home, you know, you do okay on the pop quiz. To be a student of Jesus means to Model yourself after him. To walk in his ways. But Jesus is, um, you know, there's no, uh, no soft shooting here. No soft cuddling. He does say that walking in his way in this world, this cruel world that we inhabit, is not going to necessarily be an easy way. Christianity is not necessarily going to automatically, magically, poof, make problems disappear. But rather, I think what it does is it gives us insight, a goal, meaning. You know, it has often been said about suffering that it is possible to endure almost any degree of suffering as long as you know why. What is most intolerable so we have no answer to that question. Why? 
Well, you don't have to watch the news much to know that there are Christians in the world today that are suffering a great deal, losing house and home, family, and their very lives. For the sake of confessing Jesus Christ as their Savior. Perhaps you saw on my Facebook status photo a while back the Arabic letter for uh, corresponding to the English letter N. It was in Mosul, Iraq. ISIS was going around marking the homes of Christians with the Arabic letter N for Nazarene, meaning that this house is a house of Christians and that they would be forced to convert or God or leave. So it might be difficult even to follow this. There will be times when it will be hard. It would be easier to go the way of the flesh, or to go along with the crowd, or the spirit of the times, but to stand up and to stand apart can sometimes be lonely. But to follow Jesus ultimately, my friends, begin right here. Begin right here or wherever it was that you received baptism because the baptism that you received in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit unites us to the power of Jesus' own life. So that just as He died and was buried but rose again, we too, though we may die, will rise. And we will live. We will live abundant life, everlasting. So remember your baptism. That you are joined to Jesus. That each and every day, by repentance and faith in Him, you can be infused again with His life. The world may not see it. You may not win any awards for it. life that Jesus gives is true life in me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the peace that passes understanding keep your hearts and minds in true faith until I have everlasting. Amen.